Well, good evening. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. Glad to see some travelers back with us and uh, looking forward to a good evening. Uh, James will be uh, preaching for us here in just a little bit. And let's go, let's go ahead and get started as you stand and join me as we sing Angels We Have Heard on High. All right, you may be seated. We'll uh, start with some um, prayer requests, and then Brother Joe, if you'd be prepared to pray for a few things for me. Uh, let's see, the Suttons will be back tomorrow afternoon, so we'll be praying for their travels as they head out fairly early from Colorado in the morning. And uh, keep the Leslie's in your prayers. And then also the Baxter family. Uh, I believe they had the funeral for uh, Brother Baxter's dad yesterday. I don't know any follow-up, but that's what the plan was. And let's see, and of course, um, any other regular folks that we've been praying for as they come to mind. Uh, brother, uh, or excuse me, uh, Miss Mary Briggs is being, um, she didn't have a date or anything, but as she's preparing for, go through some surgery again, I think like hip surgery, and uh, she's talking to doctors about when that plan would be. It sounds like they're urging her to do it at least by early summer or so. And let's see, uh, a praise, uh, the, we don't, uh, well anyway, the, we've been praying for uh, an average of $1,500 a week for the missions giving, and based on some things that came in the mail after Sunday, the average now is $1,504, so $1,504 per week, so praise God for doing that, I know pastor's certainly been praying for that uh, all year long. And so praise God that he's willing to do that and that he's provided for all that, which means he's obviously providing for 
the people of Bethel Baptist Church to give. And let's see, um, America and Israel, certainly. America certainly got a lot of challenges ahead, and just every state constantly dealing now with, are they going to shut more things down, what's open, what's not, uh, court cases right and left, and just lots of uh, huge challenges. The confirmation of, of the electorate uh, coming up, and so a lot of uh, interest in that. And let's see, an, an, two announcements, missionary cards. Uh, if you still have one from last year from, that says 2020 on it, please return that so we can mail those off to the missionaries. We've got probably all but eight of them are back. And then also Bible reading plans. Uh, I just handed out the, the last copy, but I can make some more right after the service if you're interested. And uh, we want to get started first thing, uh, start reading on the January 1st. We're going to use the same plan we did last year. Uh, check with pastor, and he's on board with uh, trying to do the same thing. You're just kind of going through together as a church, so it's a great opportunity to kind of be in sync. We're reading along the same things. Always welcome to read more, right? Read as much as you want, but uh, that way it kind of keeps us on track. And and then um, you know, pastor started the year last year. Is if you got questions, bring them, and uh, he'll he can address those for you. But uh, please be in the Word of God this year. It's going to be very important for us to do that. And then um, that's that's probably enough for announcements and prayer requests and so brother joe if you'll go ahead and lead us in prayer and then i'll do some missionary cards after that god it's so good to be in, in the house of god tonight god we have many many i'm sure that we could think of uh people we pray for but god the ones mentioned tonight was miss mary Briggs. lord uh, had surgery before and is going to have to have surgery again i pray god that she'll just uh, and she's there by herself and this by herself really doesn't get to go anywhere or do anything because of this COVID and uh, just kind of stuck inside. But God, she does need the surgery. I pray, Father, that you'll work uh, with these doctors, Lord, and give her wisdom with it. And uh, Father, let it be a success when she does have it done. God, just um, be with her. I uh, know she's by herself. I think Miss Polly, Lord, uh, she lives here by herself, too. And God, uh, anything could possibly happen at any time with her. As far as being by herself, you know, any maybe accident of some sort, you could never really want nothing like that. But Lord, um, I know people do look at it, look after her and check on her times, Lord. But I just pray for her safety as she's uh, this home, home alone by herself, and you know, just continue to take care of her. God, uh, the Leslie's family, Lord, I mean, Miss Leslie's sister, Lord, haven't heard much of an update on her lately. But God, I would think the prognosis may not be better. God, I, I just think of Brother and Mrs. Leslie, what they're going through. Uh, I, I would say probably every day can be a struggle. God, I know they love you uh, and they've given their lives to you, Lord. I, I, I know the flesh, they're human, and uh, oftentimes they, not oftentimes, but I'm, I would say at times, Lord, maybe they question why the things like this have, have been happening with them in their lives. And I know I probably would, um, Lord. And, uh, God, you have all the answers. And I pray, God, you'll show yourself to them. Take care of them. God, just put your arms around them and hug them and love them. Uh, I pray for these doctors that uh, Leslie's been going to. Uh, Lord, he has had many, many tests. And God, doctors have told him many, many things. And, uh, to this date, uh, nothing is worth. But God, we know tonight you are the great physician. You achieved the healing. We appreciate that. We love you for it. God, if it's not in your will to do that, I pray, God, you'll give him strength. Give his wife strength. Lord, um, carry him through the days that he's got to go forward in. And God, just to be there for him. And uh, just, again, take care of him. Pray for Pastor Miss Judy, Lord. I know they've had a great time with family and friends, uh, Lord, but more likely they're probably ready to come home to. And God, I pray for their safety as they do so. Bring them back to us. And have the pastor be refreshed and between now and Sunday, Lord, and give us a message that, uh, only that, that truly we need, and God, uh, and uh, use it in our lives. Uh, Father, pray for our missionaries, uh, even today, Lord, and, uh, I'm sure a lot of them may need you right now in a lot of different ways, a lot of different aspects of their lives. So I pray you take care of their needs, so they've given their lives to you in full service, and God, they've given up families and homes and jobs and Lord to just go out there and live for you full time and God I know doing that you'll honor uh, their service for you. I pray you'll do that tonight. God I do pray for our nation. Uh, Lord 
it seems like every day you have no idea what direction we're going in. And it's scary uh, to know that people that are in leadership and over above you that, that make decisions, uh, Lord, and you really have been saying it in the end, uh, Lord, they make decisions that can really truly affect us. And I just pray tonight, God, that do what you have to do to let them see you and realize that you're real. And God, uh, just some of the things I've heard in the last week, it just it baffles me to understand that our world has gotten to the place it is that uh, we'll do certain things to, thinking that we're helping others, but really we're not. And God, uh, and whoever it is our next president would be, whether it is President-elect Biden or if Trump works out this thing, I, you know, God, we still know that you're in control. And you're God. And uh, no matter what happens here on earth, you have the final say. And uh, God, help us to honor who our president is. And God, be the Christian and testimony we all to be. And uh, help us to be a witness and test uh, testimony to others. Because Lord, uh, this old world just uh, oftentimes picks reasons just to pick. And Lord, uh, we know that's not right. You know, Satan's uh, involved in that. I just pray that you uh, help us not to get to that and get us discouraged. As we uh, are in the battle of serving and living for you before others that we can lead others to Christ. God, uh, there may be others that I think of Pee Wee Lord. And, uh, has good days, has bad days, but uh, Lord, he's he, you know, he, he never going to be healed 100%, it doesn't appear. And God, uh, help him to enjoy that life that he has, take care of him there as he, as he lives life he can. And uh, God, thank you. I was thinking today, there's uh, a person at my church, at work, Lord, mentioned his church. And, had uh, 20 some people got COVID and uh, Lord I'm so grateful that it, it didn't it has not happened here and uh, God you allowed it allow us to have our doors open and people come and build their fellowship and serve you and God uh, be a ministry to this world through live stream or Facebook whichever one people look at and uh, God just thank you that you allow us to do that and you supply our needs God thank you for the missions God it is up to $1,504 a month uh, a week, Lord. Uh, that's the true blessing. That's, that's um, sometimes hard to understand and believe, considering the, the, the small number that we have. But God, uh, it, it's it's all you, and uh, it's because we've given ourselves to you, and you're willing to use us. And God, you prove yourself and show yourself to us. And God, that's only more encouraging for us to just continue to do what we're doing, what we've been doing. And God, that uh, you get the honor and glory. And God, there's someone that forgot tonight. I'm sorry. God, you know uh, the ones that need you, whether it's uh, spiritually, physically, financially, Lord. I'm sure many people are struggling <coughs> now financially. And uh, God, we know you can take care of them. I pray God to just lean on you and trust in you and believe that you can do that. And uh, we give you honor and glory for all that you do. And God, even if we don't understand why you do it, help us to do that. Help us to understand. And God, give us a peace that, that it will pass all understanding. God, we can keep our eyes on you and give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Got a few, uh, just a couple of prayer letters here. One, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, we did hear from Mrs. Long this week. And uh, interesting prayer request. You know that she works for BIMI and works in the insurance uh, area, so she sees all these people, uh, missionaries in the field who are, are struggling. And one of her, her prayer requests this week is that they're being reevaluated for the rates that they have for their insurance. Well, they've had a lot of folks go through some very serious illnesses, and so that drives cost up. And so she's asking that for the next month, next few months, that they have health and wellness among their missionaries, and that will help them over the long haul for their rates. So we can pray for that, that God would keep their missionaries uh, well to assist in that. All right, then um, meanwhile, uh, Praying for the Petermans, uh, Peterman family up in uh, Maine, and uh, primarily he's uh, serving a church in Vermont right now, and it sounds like it's it's possible he may end up um, staying there longer. Uh, I'm not sure if he'll end up being uh, in a uh, interim position or not, but it sounds like that's a, a real possibility that that uh, may be where he's he's going to be. Um, and so keep praying for them and. Um, 
it's quite a travel back and forth. They're not ready to move yet because of the schools and things like that. So uh, we'll keep the Petermans in our prayers. All right, also for the Kuzels, I'm going to go ahead and read his letter just because it's hard to summarize it. As we come to the end of 2020, there's much about uh, this year from a secular standpoint we're happy to see buried in the past. From a biblical point of view, we're definitely living in the last of the last days, perilous yet exciting times as we anticipate the sounding of the trumpet. We thank the Lord that we had two funerals uh, this past Saturday when two converted sinners were buried in water, and thankfully they also resurrected from their watery graves. I think they were baptized. <laughs> uh, the two young men are named, uh, yes, uh, Tishipo uh, Mashiho and uh, Sipiwe Silubani. And uh, Tihepo, uh, 25, is from a large municipality of Bushbuck Ridge where we're seeking to start churches. Back in the year 2015, he attended Bible studies and church services at uh, Kabakwini when visiting his family there. Thankfully, the Spirit of God continued to convict him, and the Father continued to draw him through these years. Um, Shihepo uh, was saved December uh, 28, 2019. I recently saw him, 19 years old, uh, by giving him a lift. I immediately began to share the gospel with him. He was so much interested in this new truth to the point that he delayed his travels that day just to hear and learn more of the word of God. So we spent the next hour at a local Mexican restaurant discussing salvation. The following two consecutive weekends, uh, Shipiwe um, uh, uh, traveled one hour back to Nelsbrut just to attend church with us at Kabakwini. This young man stays at a village um, with nearby Bush Buckridge. We now have a small group of four saved men from Bush Buckridge to assist with evangelism. On a bittersweet note, we had, a, had to discipline a Judas from one of the church plants, a man who's been with me from the very beginning our, of our time here in Nelspruit, starting in the year 20, uh, 2006. As disappointing as this is, it has neither discouraged me in the ministry nor the African brethren, for which I thank the Lord. The sweetness, however, is witnessing how the Lord is greatly blessing this particular work with a sudden influx of visitors because, I believe, the church dealt with the sin. Uh, we're, now, we're now soon to outgrow our meeting place. God is faithful. And in this first letter, it was asking prayer for, uh, I'll just call her Mama uh, Mabuza, and uh, she was in the hospital, and they were asking prayer, and then before we had time to read the letter, he sent up a short uh, follow-up saying that she had been discharged from the hospital and was recovering at home. And she had been suffering, as he calls it, from the Chinese virus. So we will pray for all of them. All right. And then also, I, I didn't ask earlier, un, uh, any unspoken prayer requests? Anyone got things they... All right. And if you got other things, I didn't ask for you to... Uh, if you had any that were spoken, but if you do, we can make sure we can include those tonight. You do. Andrew has a praise. The work has been really good recently, helping me a lot with the school. I've had some pretty big projects, and he's been helping me get them in on time. Uh, a lot of times I thought I wasn't going to, but he's been good. Amen. So it's helping that Andrew. He has been studying hard, writing paper after paper after paper. And uh, so, yes, praise the Lord for that help. Anyone else? Okay, we'll include that here. Okay, well, let's go before the throne again. Father, uh, one, we uh, just lift up a number of things. One, we praise you, uh, along with Andrew. Lord, we do thank you that you care about those things, and you've been helping him a lot. And, uh, Lord, I uh, just continue to, to um, thank you for the work, that, for the way you're going to continue to help him, and, and we're confident that you will, as you have so far. And so thank you for that. And, Lord, I know that you've also helped a lot of other folks, uh, whether health issues or resolving various things. Uh, Lord, you know all the different things in our own home that you've worked out uh, just within the last few days, and I, I thank you for that. And, Lord, there's also a number of things that uh, are unspoken. Lord, you know the details, and uh, you know what needs to be done. And, Lord, we're just coming before the throne of God as you teach us to do so. And, uh, Lord, as I don't know the details, each person sitting here who raised their hand does, and I suspect many more are out there watching. Uh, Lord, there's just things that are on our hearts that are burdens. Uh, Lord, there's health issues, there's relationship issues, there's um, worries, concerns, fears. Um, Lord, there's just all kind of things going on in our lives. And, Lord, we just come before you because we know that you care. And we are thankful that you're willing to listen to us, willing to hear our prayers, and to answer. 
Thank you for being such a faithful God, answering our prayers day after day after day. Thank you for your hand of protection about us. Lord, you protect us from things we don't even know are happening, and we are very grateful for that. Lord, we do uh, pray for our missionaries. I pray for those missionaries that um, Mrs. Long supports, Lord, that you would give them health and strength, and Lord, that you would reduce the, the uh, cost of the coverage for them so that they can uh, be deal with the insurance in the proper way, and, and uh, Lord, there'd be less uh, funds there uh, consumed, and uh, Lord, just that you'd be honored and glorified in, in doing so. Uh, Father, we also lift up the uh, Brother Peterman and his uh, kids, and uh, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that he's got there to, to work in, uh, uh, up in uh, Vermont, and Lord, I do pray that you would just use him mightily there. Lord, I pray that he would be a great encouragement to the church. Lord, he'd be able to um, preach sound doctrine, Lord, to uh, really work with the church in encouraging them in uh, faithfulness and in service, and uh, Lord, that they would just come together as a body and, and serve you in a mighty way, and Lord, you'd use them to reach the lost, to disciple the believers, and uh, just uh, bring honor and glory to your name. Uh, Father, we also uh, thank you for the, the updates from Brother Kuzel and all that's going on down there, particularly these two young men that were just baptized. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you for their, uh, their salvation. Lord, I thank you for their enthusiasm for the gospel. Lord, I, I thank you that there's now four folks there at the Bush Bokeridge area, and uh, Lord, that you would just raise up a mighty church there. Lord, I know there's a number of young uh, men who appear to be um, great material to, for as preachers, and uh, Lord, I pray that you would just raise them up, uh, establish them firmly. Lord, get them firmly rooted and grounded in, in uh, strong doctrine. Lord, that they'd be able and willing to uh, lead, a, lead the various churches that uh, he's working on to, to get planted there. And, and so, Father, we, we look forward to all the things you're going to be doing. Thank you already for answering a prayer uh, for um, this lady who is in the hospital. And, uh, Lord, I thank you for helping her to recover. And I pray that uh, uh, also for her soul, Lord, that uh, this would be a great impact. She would see that it was the hand of God that, that uh, healed her. And, uh, Lord, that you would just... Uh, uh, raise her up and, and draw her to Christ, convict her of sin, and show her a great need for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we uh, also just come before you, we praise you for um, just that blessing of answering prayers for the average uh, uh, giving. Uh, Lord, that means that we uh, are in great need of additional folks to support as we've been praying. Lord, we look forward to you showing us those people here, and just even in the coming weeks, Lord, that you would uh, help us make those connections and uh, help us work through that process there and, and uh, begin uh, supporting um, three, four uh, new missionaries, Lord. There, there's room for them, and uh, we, we just desire to do that. We want to be part of the work that you're doing. And so, Father, would you please uh, bring those along, help us to work out those details, and uh, start supporting some more folks very soon. Uh, Lord, thank you. We just lift up this uh, evening to you. Uh, Lord, uh, already I'll, I'll just pray that you just really bless the, the, the message tonight as James comes and delivers uh, what you've uh, shared with him this week. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts once again and uh, just lead us in the way everlasting. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, this time, if you will stand again. <clears throat> oh, come, all ye faithful. And thank you for being faithful and being here tonight. <laughs>
this time, James, you will come on forward, and folks will be seated as you ask them. All right, go ahead and be seated. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews tonight. The book of Hebrews. I love that book. It's a very, it just seems like a, uh, we don't know who wrote it, but it's a very well laid out argument for Christ and for who he is. And it, it's very applicable for what we have today. And many false teachings that are going around. This answers so many questions, the book of Hebrews. Amen. And we'll start in chapter 3. Our, I wanted to look at tonight how Christ is our high priest. And kind of what that means as that Old Test, looking at the Old Testament, what does he mean by high priest? What did they do? And then showing how Christ today fulfills that role for us and is really our wonderful high priest. So let's begin in chapter 3, verse number 1 of the book of Hebrews. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. If you would turn over a couple chapters to chapter 8, and let's look at verse 1. It says, Now of the things, 8 verse 1, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And it goes on to talk about the high priest. But this theme is seen all throughout this book of Hebrews and I want to, let's look at how it relates to us today, this thought of Jesus being our high priest. What does that matter and how does that affect us? Well, first of all, Christ lives today for his own. And Christ, it says that we have such a high priest, that we there is the saved, the believer. And it's their wonderful privilege to have a representative in heaven that's been here on earth. It says in John 13, 1, that he loved his own even unto the end. Um, that was when Christ began his high priestly ministry, even here on earth. It wasn't just when he got to heaven that he now serves that position, but even on earth, we have John chapter 17, which is his wonderful prayer, praying for us, interceding for us before the Father, that we would be one, that we'd share in his same relationship that he has with the Father. And he prayed for the generations that would come. And you remember that he prayed for Peter, that Peter's faith, he said, I prayed for you that your faith won't fail. You know, he knew that Peter would you know, deny him and fail in his Christian walk, but he said, I, I have prayed for you. And we have a high priest like that, Jesus Christ, that loves us, that has prayed for us and still does intercede for us before Amen. the Father. So his ministry began here on earth. And the Father, if in chapter 5, we see that this is a, prized position that Christ is not, the Father has exalted Christ too. It says in chapter 5 verse 4, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. You see the high, to be the high priest, you weren't just a, of the tribe of Levi, you weren't just another Levi, you weren't just another priest, but you were the high priest. It was the highest position of service of the Lord you could get in the older system as far as I understand and Aaron was that one that was chosen and called to serve God in that capacity as truly the high priest and it says so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest but he that said unto him thou art my son today have I begotten thee as he said also in another place thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek so Christ, I want to go through a little bit about, I'm trusting that you understand the Old Testament sacrifice system. And so I'm going to just hit some overviews of some of the differences. But I will, um, sorry, collect my thoughts here. <laughs> it, let's look at chapter 9. It gives us an idea of what the priest did first. So we get an idea of what this Old Testament system was like. In chapter 9, he says, <clears throat> verse 1, Then verily the first covenant 
had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So you have this outer tabernacle that Moses has pitched, according to God's direction, made with hands. God gave him the direction, they built it. And it has this outer court that we'd all be in, you know, maybe, well, that's not even possibly true. They, the priests, their job was to minister and to serve, and that was their duties. You know, if you were a priest of the tribe of Levi, you could be in here, you know, dealing with the sacrifice and the altar, and those were different places, but that was your job to go in there when needed and serve the Lord in this tabernacle. But there was a veil that separated what we see is called the holiest place or the holy place. And it says this, in this place contained the ark of God. So this was the special place. Not everybody got to go here. Only one person got to go there. That was the high priest. And he went there for a very specific reason. And in this, in this system, actually it, it says, goes on, so I'll keep reading. It tells us what he went in there for. Um, so it says, now it had the mercy seat in there, verse 4 and 5. And then verse 6, it says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. They were in and out of the, the big room with the things that had in it. But verse 7, it says, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So you're getting the picture here that God has created a system of worship and of those that would serve him that they go in this tabernacle, they're, just, they're a called people, they're a chosen tribe, they're ordained priests and they're going into this regular tabernacle to serve the Lord but only one gets to go into that. The, only the high priest can go into the very holiest place. It's once a year, and it's with a blood offering to put it on that mercy seat. And it, he brings that out to show us that this is exactly what Christ did. All these things in the Old Testament were types, examples, pictures of what Jesus would come and do and be. And so the Jews should have gotten this. You know, it's Christmas time. He says, it came into his own, but his own received him not. They, they missed so much of this, but some saw it. So I'm going to compare these two systems, the new covenant under God's grace, how Christ, this redemption complete, and then what it was back then. The first one was with animal blood. The priest would come offer the animal blood, whether it be of a bull or, you know, a ram, a sheep or whatever, turtle doves, or grain offerings even, on, depending on particular offerings. But they had, it was means that we get down here, but this new covenant is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse, chapter 9, verse 12 said, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So this new covenant is not just resting on the blood of some animal, which really didn't have the power to remove anybody's sin, but it did have the power to own obedience to bring them in favor with God as they did his will. But the blood of Christ sure has power today to cleanse us from all sin. This, these first priests that we see, they had a limited tenure. They were only in office so long, and it says that they, you know, each one... Death was at least the end marker for them. They could no longer serve due to death. But it says of Christ that he has an eternal nature. It says that he was made after the power of an endless life. And I won't read all these verses, but I've looked through the book of Hebrews and there's, I pulled different verses from Hebrews as he was making these points. This verse pre-searches after the order of Aaron. You know, Aaron and Moses were brothers and God established Aaron as the priest, the high priest. and this, But the second order that Christ came, he was after the order of Melchizedek, and we'll talk about him a little bit later. So he's of the lineage of Levi, this Aaron was, but Christ is of the lineage of Judah. 
and that's at 714. It says, or it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. <clears throat> so this verse preserved it was not sworn. There was, it wasn't of a surety, but Christ says it came by two promises, that God who cannot lie promised. And we find that in 721. So the Lord swore that Christ would come and fulfill this and be that high priest for us. Uh, I have a lot of things here. One is, is separated by the veil. This veil that the priest that covered the holiest place, you, you couldn't just, it, it kind of protected it from the sight of viewers. It made it a special place, a place of awe. The glory of God was there. The ark was there. And the, the writer here likens this veil. It says, first of all, that it was rent when Jesus Christ died, showing from top to bottom that the way into the holiest was now made open. You could, no one could go, just go in there. But Christ, through what he did on the cross, Matthew 7, 51, says that the veil, he rent the veil. Amen. And so it, it gives us access now. And it says in 10, 20 and verse 6, 19, that this veil was a picture of Christ's flesh. And you say it in Ephesians chapter 2, how Christ, through his own body, made reconciliation for us on the cross. So this veil is a picture of his flesh. He, these priests in this old system, they offered sacrifices for their own sin. We, you know, we, we'd all be having to do that. If we were the priest, take care of your own sins, and then you could go serve another. But Christ didn't have to do that. He didn't have to offer a sacrifice for his sins. But it says um, in chapter 9, verse 12, That's not exactly the verse I'm thinking of. <clears throat> I have a lot of verses here. Let's see, it's chapter 7, verse 26 and 27. Yeah, it says, For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests offer up sacrifice for their, his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. In other words, he, he's off, that one sacrifice he's made was, was not to cover his own sins, but it was to cover ours and others. These, under the old system, they, it was repeated offerings, year after year, time after time, day after day. But Christ, it says, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Even when it starts, in the verse, chapter, verse 3, is kind of the book of Hebrews in a nutshell. It's saying who Christ is and what he did, that he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's finished. You, know, you shouldn't be sitting on the job if there's work to do, and you know, most of the time, unless you're taking a break to get back to work, but Christ could sit down because his work was done. You know, this, this old system, it just purified the flesh and the body, but Christ came to cleanse the soul and save it. This was limited in glory, and Christ it tells us that this one excelleth in glory. In 2 Corinthians. And there's one last thing I want to note here. It says that after the priest came out of the holiest, the high priest would go in, make the offering of atonement, and God accepts it. He would come out to the people. And I noticed in verse 28 of chapter 9, it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. He went into that very holiest of places, and unto them that look for him the second for that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And that priest coming out showed that God had accepted that wonderful offering. And the same thing with Christ. He's coming again. God has accepted. The Father has accepted the offering of the Son. So I, I brought all that up to show you, kind of to remind us what was in this old system that God had established for a purpose for his people, but it wasn't to last forever. It was for a time until Christ would come. It says the time of reformation that Christ would come and establish a better, more perfect system, a better covenant that was sure and everlasting. And so I brought up earlier Melchizedek, that Christ was after the order of Melchizedek. So as we think about Christ, our high priest, it's key that the writer says that in chapter 7, goes to show by what authority you know, does Christ claim such a position as high priest? Who is he? And so he shows how, you know, it says that Levi paid tithes in Abraham. 
Well, what does that mean? Well, God looks down through line and he shows us that he sees the descendants, even though they may not be born, and he's looking at this system and who's Abraham? He's the father of the Jews. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Well, he says, well, you, we pay tithes to God. God's greater than us. He makes the rules, right? And so the same thing. God, this system, Melchizedek was called the priest, the most high God, the king of Salem. And we're not told a lot about him, but he had no beginning. He had no end, no father, no mother. He, I believe he was a type of Christ or pre-incarnate Christ, some believe, but at least a type, if nothing else. And he, so Abraham met him. And he understood who Melchizedek was, that he was the priest of the Most High God. And so Abraham gives him the tithe. The tithe belongs to God. And so Abraham's saying, you're greater. Well, what does Abraham represent? Abraham represents the father of the Jews and their race. And from Abraham, you know, comes Isaac. Isaac comes Jacob and Esau. From Jacob comes the 12 sons. One of those sons is Levi, right? And so... He's showing how Melchizedek was a lot greater than Abraham, and all these were just after Abraham. They filtered down, and he goes through in another chapter to show how he was greater than Moses and how Christ was so much greater than Moses and as knowledge as he continued to make himself known. So he shows that Christ supersedes this Levitical system. If Christ is greater than Levi, Christ is greater than Moses, than Abraham, then Christ is greater than the covenants that he gave those specific people. Christ is not bound by those. You see, you have this group, if you would, Abraham to you know, John the Baptist or Christ's work somewhere in there, and you had that group, but Melchizedek was out here away from that. So he wasn't under those rules and influences and covenants. And Christ was not from the order of Aaron. He wasn't from the middle here, confined from all those things. He was from a different order, a lineage of priesthood that was eternal. He was in Melchizedek's priesthood. And so it supersedes all that middle section, if you would. So Christ, he really had authority to be the high priest. And then just an the interjection in chapter 4, he the writer brings up the Sabbath. And we won't really get into that much, but he, another type of this wonderful rest that Christ would give. Those who come and put their faith and trust in Christ as their high priest find a rest to the soul that so many have not known. But Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that weak and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And he's talking about a rest for our soul. And so this Sabbath was just a type of the kind of true spiritual rest God would give us. So when Christ came giving us this rest, this eternal rest, we don't need the Sabbath anymore. It, was, it, it doesn't fulfill a purpose anymore in the sense that it was just a shadow. It, it doesn't compare to the spiritual rest God's given us. And so I want to move into... Christ as our high priest. So we looked at this old system and how Christ came and established a new covenant on so much better promises and so much in his own blood that's going to last forever. And how he superseded all these things. So he has the authority to be our true high priest and to come do the atoning work he did. I want to just notice four things quickly that as a high priest he does today for us. And I, if you're saved, he does these for you, whether you realize it or not. Now, he can only do them in the capacity and a sense in which you allow him. But I hope you'll consider these. The first is, he lives as the author and finisher of the new covenant, as the executor. I, we kind of talked about this already, so I won't belabor this point. But Christ came as a mediator. Chapter 9, verse 15 says, a mediator of a new covenant. And this one's eternal. It's in his own blood. It's, it's made upon so much better promises. And Christ, it's amazing, you know, in this argument of who Christ is in this book that it brings out, it talks about, it likens it to a will, to a testament, to, you know, someone writes out their will before they die, and they, of course, want it to be in good hands, 
I don't want just anybody getting a hold of it or the kids fighting over it or what. So I may pick a trustee or they're not old enough to receive it at this time if you have children. So you find an executor or a, a trustee or somebody who can you know, basically make sure it's followed and everybody gets their right of mouth. Everybody's happy, no squabbles. So this Christ, but it, those, those usually come into effect when that person dies, when the parent or guardian or whoever dies, that's when that comes into effect and they receive all the benefits. And Christ, it points out that Christ, God establishing this new covenant through the work that Christ did, his death enacted all those promises, all, the, all of that inheritance, all that will for us. And God isn't left it in uncertain hands to be distributed but it says all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. He has himself risen from the dead. He himself lives as, I guess, executor is the right word, to fulfill, to you know, make sure that this is happening the right way and to give his children the full blessings of all that he, salvation can offer. Amen. So all that all Christ did in regards to man's salvation is grace. And all we do to accept that is exercise faith. It says in 725 that he ever liveth to make it, he's able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So another thing on this thought is Christ lives as the author and a finisher of our faith in this new covenant. He has provided access to God. Remember Romans 5, 1 through 2, it says, being, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we stand. Not anybody could just go into the holiest of holies, but Christ went. And through that veil, which is his flesh, we, in, we have that same, we can go right to Christ, right to the Father, right to God through Jesus Christ. It says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And so through Christ we have access. That's what Jesus says when he says, I'm the way. Uh, chapter 10, verse 19 said it this way, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So we can have not only just access with timidity and fear, but with boldness and confidence. We can really come to God and make our requests, petitions, needs, all those things known. That's our privilege. So Christ lives as our high priest. And secondly, as our high priest, he receives and gives gifts unto men. This was one of the things the Lord Jesus came to do. <clears throat> the, one of the best gifts that he gave, I believe, in salvation was that there's two promises. God was promising his son throughout the ages, and he promised to pour out his spirit. And so Christ came, was that sacrifice, but he ascended back to the Father, and he said, I'm going to send my spirit to you. And you see that promise throughout John, John 15, 16, 14. He says, I'm going to send you the comforter, the Holy Ghost. And as the high priest, he was able to do that. He was able to ascend back up and send the Holy Ghost to us from the Father. But there's a verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. It says this of Christ's work. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So that's not the point of the message, but it is a role as Christ became our high priest. It was his privilege and job to send gifts unto men. It talks about those gifts as those were the gifts that were going to make the church work as far as functioning as a body. And the pastor's been preaching on that a little bit back. And, of course, the Holy Spirit is, you know, working in the body as well there. So he's giving grace to exercise our gifts. We see that in Romans. In 2 Corinthians 9 8, he talks about 
God's able to make all grace abound toward you that you may be fruitful in every good work. God gives us his grace to do his will. It's, it's to fulfill God's calling for our life. That was the kind of very Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 talks about you know, the grace and salvation, but it goes on to talk about how that's going to be the empowerment of the good works that we're to fulfill. So kind of a recap here. Christ is our high priest. He is able to apply the blood when we trust in him. He he's did everything necessary for salvation. And one can come and trust in him and find that he, he's the executor of that new covenant under grace that's eternal. And as a high priest, he received these gifts and he bestowed them upon his people, upon his children to do his will. Thirdly, as a high priest, he lives to make intercession for his own. Now, intercession, we often think of it as, you know, for our mistakes. He would intercede before us for the Father, and that is certainly true. But it seems to bear another flavor, if you would, another responsibility. In chapter 2, verse 18, it says, For, that, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted... He is able also to succor, succor them that are tempted. And you, sorry, that was getting there fast. We have another verse in 3, 14 and through 16. It says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. <clears throat> uh, that's, I don't know why that's there. Um, that's not really part of it. But it's supposed to be, I think, 15 and 16 of chapter 4 that it says, seeing that we have a high priest that is passed into heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, verse 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the, uh, with the feelings of our uh, infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Verse 2 of chapter 5, it says, who, hath, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for he himself is also is compassed with infirmity. Are you getting the point that Jesus, you know all this, that Christ became a man, totally human flesh, and took, he was tempted like we are, he was weak like we are, he was thirsty like we are, sleepy, you know, tired, you, you study, you know, physically what Jesus was in the flesh. He, he needed to rest sometimes. You know, he went through a lot of persecution and suffering and rejection. That was our high priest. He can totally relate to us. And uh, chapter, rest of chapter 2 kind of shows that God wanted to do that so he could. And he understands where we are in life. And so he, part of this intercession is helping our weaknesses, God knows our weaknesses. He knows where <clears throat> we're tempted, and he's able to secure us. Uh, he knows where we're struggling or weak, and he's able to strengthen us. It says that he succors the tempted, and it says he has compassion on our ignorance. I like that because, you know, I don't know if it was Will Rogers said, we're all ignorant on something. It just depends just what, or I, I forget the exact quote about what. But sometimes we're not as mature as we should be. Look in chapter 5, and it says in verse 11, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So even who he was writing to is not saying there will always be more to learn. We're always to study to show ourselves approved. But there should be a growth in our Christian life. I remember reading about Jonathan Edward, and he had several resolves, actually a lot of resolves. And one of them was to study the scriptures so faithfully and diligently as to perceive himself to always be growing in the same, in the scriptures. 
So are we growing? Sometimes we're not where we should be, and so there's some ignorance. We get to a life struggle, and because we've neglected some steps along the way of diligent study, we don't really know what to do or don't make the right decision or falter or are weak. But in all this, our high priest loves us, and he's able to make intercession, and we find the grace, the help, the strength we need. He does, it's no end to what, how many times he does that for us. I think that's amazing. And so he has compassion on our ignorance. He helps the tempted. And then he has grace on our infirmities. That Those first verses we read there pointed out those three things that he did. He has grace on our infirmities. Remember Paul? We know the story as a thorn in the flesh. Whatever it was, it's a real struggle for him. And he kept praying, God, take this away. But God said, decided to leave it. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength's made perfect in your weakness. Paul, you're gonna, I'm going to be giving you grace to help with these infirmities. So 1 Peter 5.10, it says, The God of all grace, after, who has called you unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So I want you to see that God, in whatever we're going through, we have a high priest who is ready to bestow every bit of the grace we need, every bit of the help we need. You know, there's no temptation taking us, but such is the common man, but God's made a way to escape. So we have a high priest that's actively working on our behalf, even when we don't ask for it, I think. He's still interceding. He's still praying for us, and he's still supplying us with the strength and the help that we need. And that's our wonderful privilege. We see also in Romans 8, 26 through 27, that he makes intercession for us when we pray because we don't know how to pray. I read an illustration just today in a book pastor gave me, and I, it kind of made a good idea of this intercession that Christ makes for us. I don't know who it came from, but it's one of those books that are thicker than you'll ever read, right, with 5,000 illustrations. So the, it described a little child going into a garden, you know, going to pick some flowers for her father. And she goes and picks what she thinks is flowers and some real flowers and maybe some weeds and sticks. And, you know, there's a whole bit bundle there in the bouquet. And on the way to give it to her father, she, her mother kind of sees it and helps her pull out the sticks and the weeds and all those other things. So it's just a, helps her wrap it nice. So it's just a nice bouquet of flowers, that sweet incense, that sweet fragrance. And, of course, the child then takes it to the father. But... It's a limited example, but that's kind of what Christ does for us in that sometimes we don't know how to pray as we ought. We're like a little child, but in the sincere faith, as far as when we're praying as what we believe is the will of God, he's able to take that and through the Spirit helping us and the Christ interceding for us up there, you know, we, have, we can have boldness that our prayers are heard and they're answered in that way. So Christ's ministry, he lives as a high priest to make intercession for his own. Fourthly, and lastly, as a high priest, he appears for his own as an advocate. At all times, an advocate, as Pastor said, is one that, you know, he, he, they plead for the guilty. And there's times when we just need an advocate up there. We need Christ, we come to Christ in repentance, and we need that one to stand on our behalf. The sins that would otherwise banish us from God, so to speak, don't because of this eternal covenant and our ready advocate standing there. You know, Revelation tells us that Satan, day and night, accuses the brethren. And one day there's going to be a lot of rejoicing, a big party when he's finally cast down because they're getting tired of it up there. But our advocate, 1 John 2 it says that we have an advocate with the Father. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Talks about his propitiation for our sins. And so he stands there, and in this work, God says it's a righteous work. As he's the one that can stand there and plead for us for our many failings and sins. Even He must do it even when we haven't repented yet, I believe, because God certainly knows of our sin already, and the devil's probably reminding him of it already. And so even when our hearts are hardened, and you, we're, I haven't turn to the Lord yet in repentance, he still has to stand there as our advocate, pleading our case, and it's effectual. It always works. 
So he, he appears, chapter 9, verse 24 said it this way. Verse 24 says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. You have a personal advocate with the Father. It's Jesus Christ the righteous. And through this means, we have the ability to always live in fellowship with God by our sin, the Holy Spirit walking with us down here. And as sins come, they're able to be confessed and forgiven through our wonderful advocate. But it also, when I think of it, it adds weight to our sin as Christ has to plead every time we fall, every time we sin, every time we willfully disobey, Christ has to plead for us, not so we don't lose our salvation, but he stands as the advocate saying, I've covered them. That was why I died. The blood, you, you know, the covenant is remembered and it's sufficient Amen. as the covering there. So I want to leave you with this verse, it's chapter 6, verse 19. We started out with chapter 3 where it said, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. You remember in chapter 12 where he says, after he said, Run, not grow weary. It says, Consider him, Jesus, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. <clears throat> chapter 6 says, verse 19, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Our high priest tonight gives us confidence. If you're a child of God, he gives you confidence as he ever stands to fulfill his high priestly ministry. He's the forerunner. And in chapter 12, he, in chapter 11, he gives us all those who've gone before and he gives us, in chapter 12, he says, so run. You know, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience. The weights, you know, we have some weights. They may not in themselves be sins, but they can become hindrances to us. Some things we ought to just get rid of so we'll run better for the Lord as, as he did. And there's the sins that need to be confessed as we have a ready advocate standing for us so that we can really run with patience this race that's set before us. So that's the, what I hope to accomplish in the message, just to show us, remind us of our advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. And really, the, I didn't get to share much of the, all the verses I had, but if you'll take up the book of Hebrews, it's such a wonderful flow and how Christ just supersedes everything and you'll begin to just love what it means that he is your ready high priest and how you get to join him in the intercession and in so many ways of service today. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for each one that's listened attentively. Uh, I know it's late. I pray that you would just take these truths home to our hearts, that we'd be able to think about them and wouldn't forget them very soon, but that we'd be grateful and make good use and just in every way not forget that we have a ready high priest in the heaven that we'd really fellowship with you as we should. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.